Again, taking a look at some anatomy here. So this is a cross section through a lateral view of the spinal canal, spinous process in the back, interspinous ligament between the spinous process, supraspinous ligament running over top of the spinous processes, ligamentum flavum here uh, underneath the uh, lamina and deep to the supraspinous ligament, disc, vertebral body with anterior longitudinal ligament and posterior longitudinal ligament. And the what, what I was trying to show here, this circle, that interspinous space corresponds really well with the disc space. So if you're thinking about palpation and, and landmarks for surgery, that's a good one to, to consider. So again, going back to this picture I showed earlier, just going to kind of walk you through all the anatomy here. So of course you guys know spinous process here sticking out of the back. Um, pars is you know between the two joints. So pars interarticularis is a really, I think, tough um, thing for people to conceptualize what this is. Every vertebral body has a superior articulating facet and an inferior articulating facet. Superior articulating facet joins up with the vertebral body above, inferior articulating facet joins up with the vertebral body below. Important relationship, inferior articulating uh, facet corresponds with the superior articulating facet below. Um, the pars interarticularis is basically this bone in between these two joints. And that's a really, to, to be honest, even as a resident, that was a really tough concept for me to understand. The lamina is sort of joined up with that pars interarticularis. So spinous process slopes down to lamina, goes into pars interarticularis. Inferiorly, you'll find the inferior articulating process. Superiorly, superiorly you find the superior articulating process. Transverse process here. And the transverse process is a great landmark for the pedicle which is another, of course, important landmark. So just looking at this, you know, from the back, this is obviously your view during surgery and where we're kind of trying to work. So now thinking about those nerve roots and their relationship here. So again, spinous process, lamina, pars interarticularis, facet, facet. Exiting nerve root, traversing nerve root coming down. When we talk about the classic paracentral disc herniation, we talk about uh, traversing nerve root compression. And again, you can see that picture here again. You can see where that far lateral disc herniation is gonna get the dorsal root ganglion and the paracentral disc herniation is gonna get that traversing nerve root, the nerve root that's lining up to come out of the spinal canal. When we talk about exposure of the spine for this procedure, unilateral exposure for microdiscectomies, bilateral for laminectomies. We talk about subperiosteal dissection, so dissection of the paraspinous musculature away from the spinous process in the lamina. Uh, and that exposes up to the lateral, you, you wanna expose up to the lateral extent of the lamina. You don't really wanna get into the facets because if you're not fusing, you don't wanna disrupt the facet capsules that can lead to joint instability over time. When we talk about a laminotomy, so you'll hear that term thrown around, laminotomy versus laminectomy. Laminectomy is complete removal of the lamina. Laminotomy is kind of a window into the spinal canal through a small opening. Laminotomy, you're gonna remove the inferior lip of the superior lamina. So if you're talking about an L3-4 laminotomy, you're removing the inferior aspect of the L3 lamina. You can start medially at the base of the spinous process and work out laterally. Your upper extent is the insertion of ligamentum flavum, which is about two thirds of the way up the lamina. The lateral extent is your facet joints. You really don't wanna take any more than a medial third of the inferior articulating process. You can take about a third of that process without causing instability, but you don't want to take more than that. And if you preserve, we use a drill for this most frequently, and you can kind of preserve that ligament below you to protect the fecal sac during the surgery. What to show here is, so we're looking kind of in an oblique, oblique view. If you look here, this is a relative, the, the picture on the left is a relatively small 
laminotomy. And you can see with this big disc herniation, we're really pulling on the fecal sac to try to get to that disc herniation. Just removing a little bit more bone here, still have to retract the fecal sac. However, now we can easily get that disc herniation. So it's a little bit of a, you know, Goldilocks kind of situation, not too small, not too big. You want it to be just the right size. Again, just showing here some pictures looking at kind of what a traditional discectomy looks like. I think uh, these are the bottom two pictures, probably the easiest ones to see. You can retract the fecal sac medially because there's no spinal cord here. You can do that. So you can get the nerves out of the way, get you down to the disc herniation and ultimately allows you to remove that piece of disc herniation. Sometimes depending on what the disc herniation looks like, so you need to make an annulotomy. So that's um, what they're showing here with this knife, opening up the annulus and removing those portions. Again, this is just kind of reiterating what we just saw in the last picture, just from a different kind of view. This is you know, sort of showing what we're trying to open. This is a, a kerosene punch trying to open that space. Here is the traversing nerve root getting ready to go out down below. Here is the disc herniation, retracting the fecal sac, removing that disc herniation, and then freeing up that nerve. You can see a lot of times in surgery, if you, if you notice, especially when you're on your sub eyes or, or seeing these procedures, look at the before and after the removal of the herniated disc. It's oftentimes very deformed before surgery. It'll be kind of up or pushed me. And then after you take the disc herniation, that kind of relaxes back to its natural position. Back to the far lateral disc herniation here, just as a, to show you the difference in the approach here. This is a more lateral approach. So the that dash line here, number one, was taking us down to the paracentral paramedian disc herniations. Two is sort of what you're looking for in between kind of two and three here is what you're looking for a far lateral disc herniation. You actually have to be on the outside of the spinal canal. That's what they're showing here with A and with B. B is kind of maybe the more traditional approach or the what we call Wiltsy approach to the uh, far lateral disc herniation. And what they're doing here is you can see there's some blunt dissection here uh, between two muscles, getting down to the transverse process removing some of that ligament and bone on the outside of the pars and ultimately getting to that disc herniation. Much more challenging to treat with surgery, uh, these kind of disc herniations. I very much try to get people to treat these conservatively at all costs. Uh, I think they're just more challenging and oftentimes less fruitful uh, at the time of surgery as well. Don't get a lot of disc herniation out. It can always be kind of confusing. It's very easy to get lost in these surgeries. Again, going back to this uh, picture of this big disc herniation, you know, you can see now the the problems that this presents. What do you do with this? Can you really approach this through a unilateral approach? Do you need a bilateral approach to get this out? And I would argue, I would have probably done this as a laminectomy to take the whole lamina off to get that large disc herniation out. So that's our segue into full laminectomy. You can see positioning can be relatively the same. This is our approach, skin incision in the top left corner down to fascia in this second picture, opening the fascia and doing that subperiosteal dissection, spinous process down the middle, lamina uh, out bilaterally. When we talk about laminectomy, we're talking about removing everything between the two pars. So in this picture at the bottom here, pars, pars, everything in between the two is, is gone. Again, not taking much of the joint, if at all possible, unless you're fusing. And then you kind of want your opening to be the width of the fecal sac. Anything less than that is usually not adequate to really get the job done. Um, and again, you want to avoid destabilization of the facet joint if you're not fusing. In a laminectomy, big thing to think about is lateral recess and foraminal decompression. You'll hear us throw the term out foraminotomy all the time. I had a, a mentor in residency who would always say, we don't really do foraminotomies. We do lateral recess decompressions because that's where people's problem actually is. Mm -hmm. Lateral recess is sort of this little space just at the medial aspect of the joint. And that's where you get that traversing nerve root compression, some exiting nerve root compression ultimately can lead to that lateral recess stenosis. 
When you're talking about this, you really want to find the pedicle, you want to find that exiting nerve root, traversing nerve root, and you want to get all that bone and ligament off of that area. So when we talk about surgery, we can't talk about surgery without talking about complications. So what are some complications of microdiscs and laminectomies? Well, dural tears are, are probably the number one thing that we see. Those happen, uh, if you're not getting dural tears, you're probably not doing enough spine surgery. So it happens, it's part of the job. We can usually repair them during surgery. So I kind of tell people these are something that we see. It's not all that common, but it does happen. It usually doesn't cause you any problem. Unfortunately, when it does cause you a problem, it's usually horrible and very difficult to fix. So. It's the bane of all of our existence doing these surgeries to get these, but we try to uh, do our best to avoid them at all costs. Uh, violation of the ALL is very, very rare, 1.6 to 17 out of 10,000 cases. However, it has a very high mortality rate of 50%, mainly due to vascular injury. You can get a retroperitoneal bleed from this, and this just comes with, with taking your time and not being super aggressive with your discectomy, you know, kind of working where the disc herniation is, not going too far in anterior. Wrong level surgery is certainly something that should never happen, but unfortunately it does from time to time. So we have to sort of take ownership of that and, and do our best to avoid it. The way that I've, you know, come to practice is you know, there's never such thing as too many x-rays. You can just keep taking pictures until you're totally convinced that you're in the right spot. I'll even go as far as sometimes I've done the laminotomy, I'm down to the disc and I'll say, let's just get a picture to make sure we're at the right spot here and we're, we're doing what we need to do. Persistent symptoms is probably the most common quote unquote complication, not necessarily a complication. This is where I'll put my plug in for spinal cord stimulation. A lot of people who end up with spinal cord stimulation are falling into this category of post laminectomy syndrome or failed back surgery syndrome. And, you know, why is that? What is the problem? Why do they continue to have pain? If you get scans on these folks, you know, they all have had this big disc herniation. You go in, you do surgery, disc herniation's gone. They still have pain. You know, why? Then that's really the, the million dollar question. My thought has always been that this is probably some underlying damage to the nerve that hasn't really been able to be repaired. I think if you look, a lot of times they've had long standing compression and that can certainly lead to that, but that's a little bit of a mystery as to why we get these persistent symptoms sometimes. And that's where, you know, somebody like myself, who is uh, a big proponent of spinal cord stimulation can get involved and try to help people with a functional procedure to try to block pain signals, as opposed to this kind of procedure, which I consider more of a structural surgery to relieve compression and hopefully ultimately relieve their symptoms. Infection is the risk of any surgery we do is about a half a percent risk with something like this. It usually occurs in the first month after surgery, uh, but that's fairly uncommon. A lot of times these are superficial infections, can be treated with antibiotics alone. There's no hardware involved here. Hardware is what the big problem is with infections because if in bacteria get on hardware, that's really hard to get off. They form a biofilm and it's very difficult to treat. And then in parentheses here, recurrence of symptoms, not really a complication, but something that we definitely see usually occurs within the first year. Sometimes it's secondary to scar formation. And if you're talking about multiple recurrences, maybe needing to talk about a fusion to really just take the whole disc out and ultimately fuse together with an inner body. People will do that through anterior lumbar approaches. People will do that from posterior approaches. Lateral approaches are very common now to, to do inner body fusions. The, the benefit to doing an anterior or a lateral fusion after you do a microdiscectomy is you're avoiding that scar tissue that is inevitably been created by doing that uh, initial surgery. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.